Hey, Josh Felber here, 2023, super excited. We got amazing content, amazing guests, and this one is no doubt good. You're gonna love it. If you own a business or you have a family, this is for you. Talks about leadership, how leadership and how actually being a leader to your employees, to your family, whatever that is for you, and how you can do that, how utilizing principles to help guide your employees, guide your family, guide you and holding each other accountable, challenging each other. So you got to check out today's guest, Kyle McDowell. He's going to give you tons of amazing content and insight as well. His book is phenomenal. So check out today's episode. It's fantastic. And if guys, you're all about gratitude, all about freedom, you got to check out gratitudegear.com, gratitudegear.com and use Making Bank for 10% off today. Too many times in corporate America, we expect people to do things and behave in a way that we've not really set the clear expectation. And then we wonder why they failed or we wonder why they stumbled. This isn't about training or, or, or on the job experience. What I'm talking about is the rules by which we operate. We do the right thing always. We lead by example. We say what we're going to do and then we do it. That's one of the principles. We take action. Next up, representing Primal Life Organics. Josh making bank Felber. Welcome to Making Bank. I am Josh Felber, where we uncover the mindset and the success strategies of the top 1% so you can amplify your life and your business today. Super excited and honored for today's guest. Kyle McDowell is a best-selling author, speaker, and leadership expert with nearly three decades of experience leading tens of thousands of employees at some of the largest companies in America, including United Health Group, CVS Health, Bank of America. Kyle's passion for people and proven track record for cultivating truly authentic and courageous leaders was born from an unwavering belief that there's a better way to thrive in corporate America. So I'm super excited to welcome Kyle McDowell to Making Bank today. Hey, Josh. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. For sure, man. Super excited. Uh, leadership is always so important. Excited to really ex extract and see what we can teach people on uh, leadership, uh, especially from an entrepreneurial standpoint, because I mean, I know you're in the corporate side of things, but uh, as entrepreneurs, we got to be leaders to our team, whether it's two people, whether it's 500 people, whatever that may be. So tell me a little bit about your background, how you got started, and we'll go from there. Yeah, you bet. You know, did a wonderful job on that introduction um, because I did spend nearly 30 years in corporate America. Um, as a matter of fact, my first job out of high school was with a, a regional bank here in Tampa, where I'm from. Josh, I was um, I applied for the role when I was 17 and the legal working age is 18. Wow. But I, I rolled right. the dice that between the time I interviewed and the time the uh, application was filed, my birthday would hit somewhere in between. So I'd be able to join the workforce. <laughs> And it worked. I rolled the dice and it worked. And then, you know, fast forward 28 years, my most recent gig had uh, a, a workforce of 15,000 people, a budget of $2 billion. As a matter of fact, my last two roles collectively, I had workforces up in the 28, 30,000 range. Um, wow. But my journey was really kind of peppered with examples of what I would refer to as bosses. I wouldn't refer to those folks as leaders. Okay. Um, and you know, like you, Josh, I would imagine you came into your career um, in a very uh, passionate, uh, optimistic way, right? We all enter the workforce with some type of passion or fuel that tells us what do we want to be when we grow up. And I was no different, man. I came into the workforce with an incredible amount of passion and energy. But throughout those 28 years, I felt myself becoming almost apathetic. And some of those examples of those, of those bosses that I mentioned a second ago uh, kind of put me in a position where I felt like I had more to give from a leadership perspective, and I always wanted to be the leader that I never had. So that kind of set me off on 
uh, the second chapter, if you will, of, of my professional journey. So I've, I've gone 30 year, uh, W2 guy into entrepreneur at this point, but right. entrepreneur <laughs> as well. Well, awesome. Kind of give us what's your definition that you look at as a boss and a leader kind of give us that breakdown. So it kind of clarifies some stuff. Yeah. And man, I got to tell you, I think that's where a lot of people who have direct reports get it wrong is so a boss is someone that checks boxes they are always ready to call you out or point out your errors or, or where you're lacking in terms of your delivery, the product that you bring to the team. Whereas a leader who has a lot of those same obligations as a boss, the hiring, the firing, the discipline things that come with, you know, kind of leading an organization or a team. But the major difference is the leader actually cares. They care enough to empower, to inspire, and to provide a purpose and reinstate or instill that passion that a lot of us lose throughout our career journey. So, you know, anyone can be a boss, by the way. Sure. Anyone can be. It's, it's, not, it's not hard to be a boss. It's when you transform from that boss position into a leader where you know you're having an impact and you know those around you, they'll essentially run for a wall, run through a wall for you. Why? Because they know that you'll do it for them. Um, so it's a big difference. A lot of the same similarities uh, in terms of day-to-day -day functions, but the empowering and inspiring and finding passion and purpose is where the leadership really makes hay. No, that's, that's interesting. What do you see, like, what does it take then to kind of go from that boss mentality or that mindset to that leader uh, mindset? Yeah, I think everyone needs to do a personal inventory. And you've got to ask yourself, what am I good at? What am I not good at? And how do I get better at those things that I am not good at. And by the way, I think it's really important to ask others, what am I good at? What am I not good at? And there's a, there's a theme through that approach, uh, Josh, that really is capitalizing on vulnerability. So once I can recognize my areas of opportunity and be really proud about the strengths that I have, I need to be vulnerable enough to share both with my team. And there's a, there's several reasons why you want to do that. Being vulnerable with the team obviously highlights the, the opportunities that you have, but guess what? They're already well aware of your opportunities. Those that report to you are well aware of your weaknesses. So being open about it makes you relatable. And that allows you and the team to kind of bond on a, on a different level than boss giving orders and making it less transactional and more relationship driven. So once you do that inventory, I think it's absolutely critical that the leader state their principles. And a principle, Josh, very simply is a fundamental truth. It's something we hold to be true. And as the leader, I want my team to understand the principles by which I operate because those are the same principles I expect them to operate within. And I think that's, that's lacking in a lot of companies today is here are the six, eight, ten set. Here's a principle list that we will operate by and use every single day. That way, when someone deviates or there's ambiguity in behavior, you can call them out. And it's not right. one direction either, by the way. As your leader, when I walk through and state my principles, if you see me deviate from those in the vulnerable uh, culture of excellence that I like to uh, create, the, the, the employee, the team understands not only do they have the right to point out my error, they're obligated. So I think once you do the inventory, once you state your principles, then you have to lead by example and live them every day. No, that's, that's great. Um, so I got two questions around that. One are principles and one are vulnerability. So we'll do the vulnerability first because we hear that all the time. Sure. So where is that? Like, what is that vulnerability depth? What is that? Like we're, you know, trying to share and, and connect with. And um, obviously you said, you know, people know each other's weaknesses and things like that. But I guess, where do we go with that? And then like, how vulnerable or deep do we yeah. go? Yeah. with our team? Yeah, great question. And, and anytime I address vulnerability, I actually like to substitute the word authenticity. So for me to be vulnerable, that involves me recognizing my, my faults, recognizing my areas, of, recognizing when I might be scared, recognizing that I don't have all the answers. Those are all character traits, behaviors, actions that every single human feels. It's inauthentic for me to act like I'm not concerned. It's inauthentic for me to act like I don't have faults. It's inauthentic to, to appear to be something that I'm not. So when I say be vulnerable, just be authentic, be you. So, for example, if we are facing a, an adverse or uh, an external situation that we've got to overcome, whether it be our sales numbers are down, whether it be we've got some metrics that need improving, the, the worst thing a leader can do is – act like they, they have no concern for the impact that those failing metrics have. Of course I'm concerned. 
it's authentic to be concerned about the headwinds we're facing. It's inauthentic to act as if I have all the answers when clearly I don't, because if I had all the answers, we wouldn't be in the situation we're in today. Right. <laughs> right? So I, I recognize I'm not naive, man. Vulnerability is something that I think a lot of people struggle with, but I would just encourage folks to try to substitute the word authenticity. And when you find yourself in a position where you're behaving in a way that is kind of or it deviates from your principles or if someone, if, if, if a close friend or relative were to walk by and see you behaving, they'd be like, that's Josh. That's how Josh behaves. You're not being authentic at that point. So I think if we could scrap vulnerability and go authenticity, a lot, of, a lot more leaders would adopt and kind of move into this area I'm preaching. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Cause I just wasn't sure. It's was like, okay, do I like, am I sharing like, oh man, my kid's struggling in school and you know, da, 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 and so it's affecting me here. So I can't make the right decisions or, hey, or do we, boundaries, right? Right. So you can be absolutely yeah. authentic and vulnerable, but not necessarily to the point where I have a, a good friend of mine. She uses this word, uh, energy vampire. So mm. I can be vulnerable and share with you things that are going on outside my, you know, our, our, our four walls of the office. But that doesn't mean I need to be the energy vampire and like dump everything on you. I need to right. be we're here to do a job, right? So I, I think authenticity is key. By the way, when you connect authenticity with relatability as the leader, if, I, if my team knows I'm authentic and they can relate to me, that equals trust. Authenticity plus relatability equals trust. I found it over and over again. It's true. No, that's great. And that's, I think, a good clarification of that there. Uh, so you talked about principles and people and, and the team knowing the principles and things like that. What are like those like four or six principal categories that we should be looking at um, that we're make sure we're conveying to our team? Yeah, well, Josh, for me to answer that for anyone would take away from their authenticity. So I think they're, they're personal to every single person. Now, of course, there are a universal set of principles that I think would be really hard for many people to refute. So you mentioned at the introduction, I'm a best-selling author. My book, Begin With We, 10 Principles for Building and Sustaining a Culture of Excellence. They're not theoretical. They are principles that I used when I led a 13 or 14,000 organization, an organization of 13 or 14,000 people. Sure. Um, I stated those principles very, very conspicuously up front and said, guys, these are the rules of the road. These are how we treat each other first and then how we treat those we serve. And, and there are kind of three categories within these 10 principles. But to answer your question directly, the first one is we do the right thing always. Very simple, right? That's yep. not, it's not rocket science. But the point is, if we are conspicuous in stating this is a principle by which we operate, the very first opportunity that, that, that comes along where someone might stray from the right thing or someone might deviate or not necessarily make the decision that they'd be most proud of later on, when that happens, you've already created the foundation that says, hey, wait, Josh, we do the right thing always. That word is always there, always. And then they run all the way through in the very last we as we obsess over details. Everything in between there is how we operate and execute and build this culture of excellence. I think one of the most important of those principles, and I think we're, where we're probably missing in a lot of companies today is, is, and it's my favorite, we actually, is we eight, we challenge each other. So in most environments, the only person allowed to challenge is who? It's the boss or the leader. Sure. So it, but in a culture of excellence, we are obligated to call out when our peers are not performing up to the team's standard. It's not my personal opinion. We have a standard by which we operate. And Josh, you're not quite hitting that standard. I think it's an obligation for me to mention that to you because as a team, we're successful. No individual is successful on one team. It's the team that becomes successful. So we have to challenge each other or else we're accepting the status quo. That's a tough one to embrace, but it is something I think a lot of companies could, 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 could benefit from taking on. No, for sure. I, I think that's huge. I mean, as challenging from both ways, I think is, you know, is great. Cause I know even from like, um, like myself, my dish profile, you know, I'm like, I, I like challenge. I like to go after, you know, my high D and stuff like that. And so if you don't have that from, you know, your team and stuff too, you know, then you kind of have that disconnect, I think, you know, right. in, in what you're doing. And how boring, by the way, if you're in an organization <laughs> or a team where, Let's just pretend I'm kicking ass on the team. There are a couple guys or gals on the team that aren't pulling their weight. Like that is exhausting, first of all. But then, all, but the the beauty of the journey that we're all on is overcoming challenges, right? If we're not overcoming challenges, we're not improving, and you're accepting the status quo. And I, and I would imagine none of your listeners are okay with the status quo. Mediocrity sucks, right? Yeah, one hundred percent. So obviously, you've got 
tons of experience working with tens of thousands of people at different companies and everything else. What's kind of some of the same issues that you've seen throughout these different companies, um, whether it's from a team environment, whether it's from a boss environment, that once you've been able to come in and say, okay, cool, you know, these are the different things that we've now fixed, now the team is way better, or as a boss standpoint, these are the things that we've been able to correct and fix over here, now all of the bosses are better. <laughs> <laughs> Just like that, huh? Well, I think there's a common, there, there are several common threads, and uh, when I created these principles, the 10 we's, they were kind of a culmination of years of experience that, you know, kind of left me lacking or wanting more, I should say. An example that I think is absolutely prominent and especially huge, or the bigger the organization, this malaise is, is more common. And that is obs obsessing over activity and judging ourselves based on our activity versus the outcome. So I'll give you a silly example. Man, I am absolutely thrilled that my Uber driver puts gasoline in the car before he picks me up. I really appreciate that. I thank him for that activity, but I don't pay him for that. I pay for the outcome. I pay for that ride. I pay for, to get from A to B. So I think a lot of companies are in this place where they, they conflate busyness with progress. And a leader oftentimes, so in my consulting work, I'll sit down with executives and ask them what's troubling the organization, you know, talk about the culture you know, how they could be more effective specifically in, in the role that they play. And nearly every answer involves the number of meetings they attend every day. If I could just get out of this many meetings, I'd actually get some work done. I'd make, I'd make progress. And they almost wear it like a badge of honor. I've had executives flip their laptop around to me and say, look at this calendar, Kyle. How do you expect me to spend more time with my team? I've got 13 meetings in an eight hour day. How do I do it? It's not a badge of honor. So I challenge, I challenge those uh, folks in my consulting practice, and I would issue the same challenge to you and your listeners is, if you cannot draw a conspicuous line from activity to an outcome that you've already agreed must be delivered, why are you doing it? Now, I'm not naive. There are compliance things. There are legal reasons why you must engage in certain activities. But by and large, in my experience, I've found a lot of the activity in which we engage every single day and hold to be so important, the client or the customer doesn't care about because they care about the outcomes. So you gotta draw that line from one to the other. There's also a, a, this, this kind of condition that I've noticed in many companies, especially the bigger ones, and that is, and I address it with we number four, we take action. So I, I, I really, I come from the school, Josh, that if I see something, I must do something. So if something's broken or there's an opportunity yeah. for us to be better anywhere on the team, whether it's within my domain, my peers' domain, anywhere, it's my obligation to take action on that. I'm not saying you play cowboy and take over someone else's world or jump in their sandbox, but it's your obligation to do what at that point? Challenge them. So if you, if you observe there's a problem or observe there's an opportunity for improvement and you don't act on it, you are endorsing status quo. You're endorsing mediocrity, and that gets you lapped in business. You've got to recognize the opportunity and then address it. If you, if you recognize the opportunity and don't address it, you're part of the problem. So I think between not taking action, just kind of being – happy with the status quo. There are a lot of executives making a lot of money, man, that don't have an opinion. So what does that mean? They just follow the status quo. They don't take action on those opportunities as they identify them. And they certainly don't challenge those around them to get better because there's comfort in that mediocrity. But that's, a, that, that's the boring part that I mentioned earlier. That mediocrity to me sounds incredibly boring. For sure. And I know one of the things when I was reading through some of your content and everything, and uh, it's actually cool because I mean, what we're doing with our company, everything right now, we're in that whole leadership and, 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 and working with our team to, you know, help them grow up and, you know, just uh, from a culture standpoint and things like that. But um, one of the things I really liked is you talked about, like, um, you know, think like you're the founder. And I know Jesse Itzler talks about that some and, and Sarah Blakely and stuff. So I curious kind of like what your take is on that. Yeah. You know, as, especially in bigger companies, my connection as an employee with the outcome of the company, the good, the company does the value the company brings to the organization. That connection is often very fractured or doesn't exist at all. That's why I'm so adamant about principles, by the way, mission statements, corporate vision, those things are important, but rarely do they actually connect the frontline employee, the person who's actually responsible for getting the work done and wowing your customers, rarely do they connect that person with the overall charter of the company. You know, mission statements, they sound great. They look good on a wall and T-shirts, maybe great bumper stickers. 
but they don't tell me how to behave in a way or compel me to behave in a way that delivers excellence. So thinking like the founder uh, reconnects that connection or it, re it re energizes that connection rather. If I think like the founder and I recognize something has an opportunity for improvement or I see someone's not pulling their own weight or they're phoning it in, the founder's not going to stand for that. So if you think like the founder, you take on ownership, uh, which is an uncomfortable word for a lot of folks and is ownership. But I think it's <laughs> yeah. so important if you want to be successful and lead a team and a culture of excellence. Yeah, no, I think that's super important. And I, I really like what you talk about with that is, is, you know, think like the founder, which is, you know, taking ownership in what you're, what you're doing. What have you seen like throughout your journey and stuff, you know, as you come in and you have employees that are not taking ownership, what's kind of that process or ways to be able to engage them and to start to do that? Yeah, there's a, you know, there's another we here that I've got to introduce that I think <laughs> matters a lot when we want folks to take action. And it's the very subsequent we, it's we own our mistakes. Because if you, if you want people to take risks, if you want folks to address items or areas of opportunity, but by the way, they're broken because no one has addressed it or they're not addressing it appropriately. So if you want your team to address those broken items or address the areas of opportunity, you have to let them be comfortable and, and encourage and create an environment where people are comfortable making mistakes. We got to own those mistakes, though, because the worst thing that happens is we make a mistake, we hide it, and it kind of perpetuates over and over again until it blows up into something massive, right? But I cannot encourage my team to take action, to challenge one another, to embrace those challenges, to obsess over details if I don't allow them some space to make a mistake. So it's really important when those mistakes are made, you lead by example and you pick up the person that made the mistake. You assure them or reassure to them that they have value on the team. I'm not naive enough to admit that there aren't mistakes that are fatal, right? There are people that make, they have big screw ups. And I like to kind of refer to those <laughs> as mistakes of malice because they didn't care enough or they just, they did it on purpose. I'm talking about mistakes right. that are made out of genuine effort to be better mistakes that are made because we're not comfortable with where we are and our progress or the mediocrity we're delivering. So you've got to create that environment. Otherwise, none of that's going to happen. And we number two is we lead by example. So anytime I recognize an opportunity and my team around me see me not take action on it, assign someone to it, or roll my sleeves up and take action on it myself, that example that I'm setting means everything else is a house of cards and I'm a hypocrite. So you have to live the principles that you establish and it's much easier to hold others accountable to those same principles if you're living it every single day. Mm, yeah, no, I think that's, that's super important. I think that's huge you know, with that is definitely owning the mistakes. What you talked a little bit about, I think that's pivotal is like a lot of people are afraid to own those mistakes. Like, Oh, I'm going to get fired or I'm going right, to right. get written up or, yep. you know, I don't want to bring it to your attention. <laughs> so how do we encourage or how do we get them to feel comfortable with that opportunity? You've got to be real about it. So when I make a mistake, I don't hide from it. I think a lot of bosses err in that way. They have to be or, or put off this air of perfection. They sit on this, what I call a, a perfection pedestal. When I make a mistake, the first person to admit it to is a member on my team because they usually have, have an answer or can help me find the answer. So leading by example, when I screw up, just saying so. But also, this is a contagious principle, if you will. If someone on the team makes a mistake, whether they owned it and brought it to you or not, or whether it was brought to your attention by some other means, how you handle that mistake, how you handle the employee or the team member that made that mistake tells the rest of the team, you're, you're serious about this, owning our mistakes, and you're serious about picking each other up, and you're serious that this is not an environment of retribution. Again, some mistakes should be dealt with swiftly. There's no question. But if a mistake is made from a genuine, genuine effort to be better, then you've got to allow for that mistake and encourage people to make those same efforts. The first time it happens, you react in a way that is, you know, that has some type of retribution or you smack around somebody for making a mistake. The rest of the team is not going to be on board with that principle and you've become a hypocrite. So live it. Yeah, no, I think that's super important. I mean, and that kind of even applies back, you know, to your kids or anything like that as well, too. So, you know, whether it's... Uh... Your team Josh, or your team of kids. Since you, <laughs> since you mentioned that, a really, really quick story. I, um, I used to have a fella on the team who had, I think at the time his son was maybe five or six years old. And in this particular organization, we had 10 Wee's coffee cups, coffee mugs mm. made. And his son would eat cereal out of the coffee mug every morning. One morning, 
his son had an accident. He, he tipped over the coffee cup, cereal was everywhere. He looks up at dad and says, it's okay, dad, we own our mistakes. I'll clean it up. How, how impactful was that to me, man, that those principles, they transcended the workplace, and now he's got his five-year-old living the same thing. So it also sets the example that, and it shows the example that when you live it every single day, the impact you have on those around you, and obviously his son has heard him say that multiple times. Right. No, that's awesome. That That's super cool. Um, you know, to be able to see that ingrained, you know, with what you teach and what you're doing in your culture at work, um, back to your family and everything for sure. So, right on. so we got a little bit of time left. What's something you're like, oh man, I really want to make sure I share this with the audience or make people aware of this and everything before we wrap up in a little bit. Yeah. I mean, we've, we've touched on it already, but I'll go a little deeper and that is being very conspicuous about the principles within the kind of the bounds that you operate, establishing your principles as a leader removing ambiguity and making sure that you live it every single day sets the example for those around you to do the same thing. Too mm. many times in corporate America, we expect people to do things and behave in a way that we've not really set the clear expectation. And then we wonder why they failed or we wonder why they stumbled. This isn't about training or, or, or on the job experience. What I'm talking about is the rules by which we operate. We do the right thing always. We lead by example. We say what we're going to do and then we do it. That's one of the principles. We take action. We own our mistakes. We pick each other up. Focus on outcomes over activity. Challenge each other. Embrace those challenges. And then lastly, obsess over details. It was very important for me to be conspicuous about the way I want the team to behave, and more importantly, how they can expect me to behave, because I can't hold them accountable otherwise. Hmm, There's true. a degree of, again, vulnerability that we talked about that must come about for us to say, team, Here's how I'm going to treat you, and here's how I would really prefer you treat me. There's no difference, right? There's no leadership gap here. We're all on a level playing field. I'll hold you accountable, and I'll call you out when you deviate, and I expect you to do the same. Too many times in the corporate environment, those very clear lines of engagement and how we behave, they're not drawn. So what do we have to lean against? A mission statement. You know, there's a, there's a huge pharmaceutical company in America that has the mission statement, helping people on their path to better health. It's a beautiful statement. How the hell do I do that tomorrow when I go to work? How do, how <laughs> do I help people? Right? So if I yeah. know these are the, the principles by which we operate every day and I'm faced with a challenge, well, I know I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to embrace that challenge because that's one of the principles I agreed to be uh, a part of. So be, be, being conspicuous, drawing the lines of, of accountability around those principles and living them every single day, never deviating. You know, there's a, a thing that I refer to as the mirror of truth. Am I behaving in a way that if I really turn all the noise down, turn off all the BS, am I looking into a mirror of truth that will tell me I'm behaving in a way that's authentic and consistent with my principles, or am I behaving in a way that is consistent with a boss? And how do I want to be remembered? And I don't want to be a boss because a leader has so much more of an impact on people's lives, their well-being, their passion, purpose, and fulfillment for the role they do. It's a leader's obligation to unlock all of those. No, nah, that's awesome. Guys, I hope you guys are listening to what Kyle's talking about. Whether you have one person in your company, 20, 50, 100, whatever that may be, maybe you don't even have a company, but you have a big family or a little family, this can all apply to you. So make sure you guys are taking notes. Listen to what he's talking about. Go back, rewind, listen, watch this again. Grab a copy of his book as well, because I think that's going to make a huge difference in what you're doing, uh, helping you with those different principles that he's talking about. Um, we have the link below. And really understanding, you know, how to work with your team, how to communicate with your team, but from a leadership perspective, not from a boss perspective. So Kyle, super awesome. Where can people get more information on what you have going on? Obviously the book link on Amazon and everything. Yeah. All of my socials are at Kyle McDowell Inc. My website is kylemcdowellinc.com. And as you mentioned, uh, the book Begin With We, it's available worldwide, audiobook, ebook, uh, paperback and hard copy. I'm a fan of the audiobook, to be honest. Yours truly narrated. And it really just, I think the book comes to life with the audiobook, personally. You know, the audiobooks are always awesome. It's funny, my boys love to listen to the audiobooks. And when we drive the martial arts every week, we always are listening to audiobooks because we got 25 minutes each way in the car and the kids love listening to all the different ones. So um, well, now you have a new one. 
I, oh, I know they liked yours, so it was for, it was awesome. it was definitely definitely great for sure. All right, guys, uh, Kyle, again, thank you for your time today. Really appreciate it and sharing some amazing insights uh, with our audience today. It's my pleasure, Josh. You're doing great things, man. I'm really happy to be a part of it. Thank you. I am Josh Felber. You were watching Making Bank. Get out and be extraordinary. Oh,